Hello, and welcome to the Afro Reads podcast with your hosts, Amara and Uguchi. Afro Reads is a book review podcast that was created out of our shared love for reading African fiction books. We talk through its themes and try to tie its key messages to our African heritage, culture, and contemporary issues. We invite you to turn the page and let's begin. Welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us on episode nine of our Afro Reads podcast. I'm your host, Ugochi, and I'm joined by Amara and Weiwei from South Africa. Today, we'll be talking about the book that we read, Period Pain by Kapano Matlwa. I hope I pronounced that right. <laughs> Matlwa. <laughs> You tried. <laughs> <laughs> yes. As I said previously, we're joined by our special guest, Weiwei, and I'm going to turn it over to you, Weiwei, to tell, you, to tell us a little bit about yourself, like where you're from and a little bit about your background. Um, thank you so much for having me. So my name is Weiwei Butelezi, and I am the co-founder of uh, Click Book Club. So basically, our book club is a month-to-month book club where we meet and discuss our current read. And, you know, each and everyone will take what represented them well in that book. So outside of the book club, I work for the city of Johannesburg under the EMS unit. I, I am a wine lover. I really love wine. <laughs> <laughs> I would love to even own a vineyard one day. <laughs> red or white um, it doesn't really matter as long as it's dry and it's not box wine ah interesting yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> and um yeah I, I i love books i my my family is the first thing to me you know and yeah nice. and i love love i'm a sucker for love <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you for joining us today. Um, it makes our conversation richer that you ha- that we have you since we are talking about a South African author. I mean, a South African book by a South, Af- South African yeah. author. So now I'm going to ask you three fire questions. So just answer answer with the first thing that comes to your mind. Okay. All right. So you said <laughs> okay. <laughs> Uh, you said that you have, you love wine and your favorite wine is, you like dry wine. Can you tell me your favorite brand of wine? I think it would be Bayes Kloof. Ooh, I've never heard that before. Oh, you would love it. You would love it so much. It's like heaven on earth. <laughs> huh. Have to research. Yeah. Okay. What's your favorite South African dish? Oh my gosh. Um, I would say umkhodu. Okay. Because, yes, because my granny really, really loves it. <laughs> I appreciate it for you a lot. <laughs> what was it made out of? Is it a grain? Is it lentils? Yeah. Is it pulses? You know what? I think it's tripe, right? Wow. But then it, yes. <laughs> But then I, I think because I'm not a fan, I don't want to be there when they cook it because it smells really bad. <laughs> yeah, but I love it. I love the texture of it. I know. What you yeah, mean. so, yeah, but it, what, do you just like peppered tripe or do you like it in stew? Do you like it in soup? You must like stew. the tripe. Stew, okay, stew. Yeah, so they really like ex- People that can cook literally can, they know how to make it mm-hmm. taste really nice. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You're making me crave for some now. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> but in Nigeria, we usually have it in pepper soup. Do you guys have it in like, do you know what pepper soup is? No. no. It's like, it's like, um, what should we, it's like watered, it's like assorted meat in like water with a lot of spices Mm -hmm. um so it's very peppery and you're just basically drinking the water and eating the meat uh can't describe it oh yeah so they don't add a lot of spices 
uh okay no so we do so pepper soup you that's why it's called pepper soup because you add a lot of pepper and a lot of other spices i've forgotten the spices oh okay obviously i don't oh, okay <laughs> pepper soup. <That's> okay. yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah right. no people people have different styles of cooking it but it's yeah. you know once you get used to it it it's kind of nice because we even have something called mohodu monday that's how popular it is so every monday there are spots maybe in now a township where you have it with stamp or um it don't follow you know and people just come and they chill they have their drinks and they have tribe mohodu okay okay yeah would you say it's like a national dish or a local dish is it a dish or a type of meat just meat people enjoy i would say both okay yeah i would literally say both because it's meat that people would cook at a a, a, a gathering yeah, if people prefer. have like some sort of gathering or a traditional ceremony you know but yeah. it's also like a dish where people can just go chill somewhere have their beers and have that as as a meal mm. yeah cool all right last question what's your favorite book ah uh, guys <laughs> <laughs> i think it will always be i write what i like by steve Biko. Oh, interesting. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. I think after reading that book, although I've always been a very proud Black person, but that book just added to my proudness, you know? Mm -hmm. Just added to me seeing myself as a beautiful young woman that has so much potential regardless of her skin color. Interesting. So where is the author from and like what, I guess, setting is the book based? So he passed on. He was a political activist. Yeah. So he came, yeah, he came up with the ide ideology of Black consciousness. So Black consciousness is basically telling Black men that they're good enough. You know, they need to take care of, uh, of each other, that they do not need a, a white man to validate their existence. They do not need uh, a white man. They do not need to feel inferior when there's a white man amongst them you know so it just talks about why we should be proud as as black people and the authenticity of of ours that we don't even see you know the power that we we possess that we 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 haven't even seen how how amazing or how powerful it is mm -hmm. you know so yeah, yeah it's it's a very good book <laughs> i know um denzel washington played him in a movie is that something you guys were proud of or you'd have preferred like a south african do you have you ever watched the movie of his life you know what to tell you to tell you the the, the truth and I, I i i personally feel like it was wrong <laughs> yeah <laughs> i know honestly i i felt like it was wrong we have a lot of talent you know, we have a lot of young people that would like to be seen, you know. Now we have a South Africa, uh, an American person playing a role of our hero. I, yeah. I personally felt like it was an insult to us as South Africans, you know. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. I can see that. But on their end, they are probably, they're looking at it from a business perspective. Like who... Yeah. Who will watch Denzel Washington on the screen? Would I have watched yeah. if, if like a South African guy played it, you know? Um, it's the way I feel about Half of a Yellow Sun and, you know, you have Sandy Newton and Annika Rose, uh, Noni Rose play the characters Olana and Kainene. I'm just like, we have a whole movie industry and you couldn't find anyone but exactly I mm -hmm. yeah that's my point <laughs> yeah 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 i'm also thinking guys out of all the actors that we have not even one come on yes we love denzel i mean yes but come on yeah i agree just to say i love blood and water on netflix right it's south african <laughs> 
Um, yes. Do you watch it, Ugochi? Let me write that down. Oh my God. How can you not watch it? Piki. Piki and. Ugochi um, doesn't know what happens to her time. I <laughs> know. I have a list of things I need to watch. How can you not watch it? Yeah, I really like Yeah, it's just really nice. It's, it's, uh, it's something for us to be proud of that that is made in South Africa. It makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Storyline flows. Look, look yeah. at the talent. You know, it's mm-hmm. there. It's there. Yeah. This next part is current events. So I guess we all, each of us say something that has been on our mind in terms of what's going on in the world. Yeah. Yeah. So, wait, wait, do you have any, anything? No, you guys, I don't want to be the one that speaks okay. a lot. Like, I want, I want to take your ideas as well. Okay. <laughs> no, this podcast is for you. You are the center of attention. You're meant to shine, <laughs> baby, shine. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'll go. Yeah, Ugochi, go first. This past week, I've been watching, I don't know if you guys heard of the Kyle Rittenhouse case. The what? Kyle Rittenhouse. This is an American this event happened in America. <laughs> no, what happened? Um, so last year du- during all the riots in the US, yeah. Um, there was there was one in the state of Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. Um, and Black Lives Matter and Antifa oh, and yeah. were rioting and protesting. And um, so this this guy who was 17 at the time he came over to the area and he he came over with this gun and some friends and wanted to protect a building ah, okay that had like car parts and yeah so yeah it got so it got to the point where he shot someone he killed two people actually he shot four people i believe killed killed two mm-hmm. um and then the media portrayed him as like a white supremacist racist a killer um yes so i at the time i wasn't necessarily following what was going on um Mm -hmm. but i do know i at that time i didn't know the media is just out of control right i can't make a decision unless i really see the facts so the the um, trial has been going on this week and it turns out that he was he shot those people in self-defense and you clearly see the video of the person that he killed like lunging at him Mm -hmm. um, trying to get him and he shoots and then other people same thing and he's d- um, in between these instances trying to run to the police station, like to turn himself in. But these people, like you see them on camera, on video, like trying to trying to go after him. And even when he got to the police department, he said, I shot someone or someone, I, I shot someone oh in the way. So I, it's, been intriguing for me to watch because he was portrayed as such a bad person in the media the black lives matter movement he like um also i'm still trying to process the fact that this guy went to the police station but they turned him back after saying that he killed someone right because this time it was so political at this time um you have Black Lives Matter and T- like they're rioting in the streets all over the U.S. and yeah. they didn't want law enforcement didn't want to get involved because they felt like it was the right of the citizens to be upset and so they yeah. went on looting. Um, so I don't under I don't understand right, but some people would yeah. argue like, well, the citizens are upset. Black people are upset, you know, at the killings of of other black people. They have a right to go and do these things. So let them do it and let the police not get involved, which I think is, I don't understand that, but yeah. So these people were given the right to loot. Pretty much. (laughs) And destroy property. And destroy property. Property that helps them. Yes. (laughs) Guys. (laughs) This is so interesting. I'm actually going to look it up, eh? Yeah, you should. You should. Yeah, this is really interesting. Mm-hmm. I want to read about the guy because I think I understand where you're coming from when you say they're portraying him as a bad person when he was trying to do the right thing. But they were, he wasn't allowed to do the right thing. And even with the video, it shows that 
he was being attacked. Yes. You know, I was telling uh, my friend the other time that it's so easy to, for us to blame everything on, on race yeah. because that's the dominant thing, mm -hmm. you know? Like, you fail at school and you're like, yeah, because I'm black. Right. You know, it's because people do not want to put the extra effort for things that they want. And now race makes it very easy for me to become entitled, even yeah. for things that I am supposed to work for. This is, I mean, this is the argument that I have with so many people, like, and because race is such a, a sore spot for people, there's, yeah. there's the government uses that to further, to further trigger or drive whatever agenda that they want to. They'll say, oh, race, race, race. You get upset, yeah. you'll be on yeah. their side. They're able to do what they want to do. Yeah, true. So I just wish that people would look beyond race and, and know that I don't, I, racism, like it's one thing for someone to be racism, racist, that's on them, yeah. right? It's on them to be, yeah. it has nothing to do with you, but it's a, what you should focus on is the power part. Like if you were to have power, race, race doesn't necessarily matter whether someone likes you or not it's more they respect your pockets yeah so i wish That's that true. people would understand that and i think they'd have a better view on what's going on but it is so true yeah That's yeah true. that is so true <laughs> yeah it's interesting mm -hmm. that i don't know about it like I'm not someone I I I've stopped watching news since last year and the whole COVID thing because yeah, as you said, I think the media just gets your weak point and then just hammers at it. And so I've just stopped watching the news because it's just always depressing. But it's I usually have my ear out for like um um trending news. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's funny that this is not getting traction or detraction where I would hear about it. And it's yeah. Because, yeah, it's it's talking about a narrative that we really don't want to connect with, which is that we can be a bit biased. Yes. For for racism, or is it yeah. again, like the, take the other? So that's that's all I have to add to it. Like I now have to go and sit down and really, really, really like um listen to the story and read about it. But yeah. I, mean, I actually want to read about it as well. You like, and it's, it's really interesting. They were even saying that, oh yes, he killed a black man. So black people were getting super upset at him. They're all calling him uh, racist, a white supremacist. He didn't. He didn't kill. He didn't shoot any black person. They were all white. Really? So it's this is what makes me upset. Like they use race to. They think you're stupid, and they use race, and you, and people fall for it. You know? Yeah. It's yeah. Really bothers. Yeah. Me. Really, he didn't kill yeah. a black person. No. <laughs> Like, yeah, yo, no, that it, it, it's really interesting. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Oh, I have I have my topic for the week. Okay. <laughs> so have you guys have been talking, I have been cracking my brain, cracking, 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 because I've just been too busy to even look at anything other than my work screen. But the funny thing happened. So in COP, COP 20, um, 26, obviously that happened this week. Yeah. All the heads of state gathered. My funny news to share is that um <laughs> <laughs> it's really funny. Wait, wait, wait. Camilla, you know Prin Prince Charles's wife, yeah. Camilla, <laughs> been going around telling everyone. Why are you guys laughing? Because I know what you're gonna say. <laughs> Going around telling everyone that Joe Biden farted loudly. <laughs> I, I think I think she said he also stank as well. Oh my gosh. And then since then I've been wondering, like, of course he's allowed to fart. He's a human being, but at the same time, I'm just like, if I heard or smelled his fart, like, would I still regard him in the same way? You know how we regard like heads of states, especially the US heads of state are like gods. Like it's hard to imagine, I don't know, Obama on the toilet seat, you know? <laughs> like, do you really regard them that same when you smell his fart? So that's my own piece of news that I just thought was hilarious. <laughs> and I probably just been going around complaining that I was just really disrespectful, disrespectful and all. And I'm just like, Man, you're really killing this man's reputation. <laughs> I think because there's no respect there. And I also, but, 
I also He's an old man. He doesn't care. <laughs> I also heard that he had a bathroom accident. <laughs> Uh, I don't even really know what that means. Yeah, so <laughs> yeah, I heard that one too before I heard the fart one. Wait, um, what happened in the bathroom accident? Even if I, I don't want to do it, but I well, I heard that I think he was he was late for a meeting or a picture is mm-hmm. one of the two because he had a bathroom accident. <laughs> so then, if you, I'm not so I'm not sure if this is connected with the picture that they all took, but you see him at the way, the far. Mm-hmm. Right, to his right, right? The mm-hmm. end of the picture. Whereas I guess in previous years, the like the stronger leaders of the world are usually in the middle of these photos. Uh, you, have out, you have to check out the photo. It's <laughs> <laughs> it could have been doctored, you know, media, but maybe he just had food poisoning. Maybe. Oh, <laughs> is this weird? <laughs> Record from here. Another another funny situation that happened recently was um, th- there's foil scarcity in the UK because of the Brexit yeah. situation, lack of lorry drivers from like EU countries. So there was foil scarcity, basically bringing the foil to the bringing petrol to the petrol stations, and they arrested five Nigerians because they were doing black market. So they were selling. <laughs> Petrol out of jerry cans right here in the UK, like in London. That's something we do in Nigeria. But so when we just find situation, we just find opportunity in every situation. Yeah. So, yeah, there yeah. are traffickers and people and pimps, but there are also a lot of doctors, politicians, legends yeah. in South Africa. So we are just too many. They they do find a plan, hey? They they make the most out of everything. <laughs> make the most, make the most. Yep. Um, I think my highlight of so uh we had our local elections on the first of November, and it was just so sad to see the number of young people that did not vote, you know. Like young people are angry, young people do not want to participate anymore, young people have no knowledge. Young people feel like voting is useless, you know? And I think another thing is the fact that we have like a dominant like uh, party, the ANC. I'm sure you guys are aware of it. Yeah. You know, so people were, you know, they had their own opinions about how they have betrayed them. They, They portray themselves as the party for the people, but people have literally lost faith in them, you know? And it's just so sad how our, our you know, our political activists like Robert Sobu, uh, uh, Steve Biko and them, it feels like now they died for nothing, like absolutely nothing, the way the, the remaining leaders are, are leading the country. So it was just so sad to watch the, the outcomes of the, uh, uh, the results, the number of people that voted. Like, for instance, I'm the I'm literally the only one that voted at home because my brother was like, no, vote for what? These people are not doing jack shit for us. These people have abused us for so long and we're just so tired, you know? But is it very manual? So it's, is it manual or is there like computerized versions where people like vote with the machine? Because in Nigeria, like, I'm not going to vote because I'm going to be under the sun for like five hours. And it's very manual where people like write things with paper and pen and it's just really sad. So is that the same thing? Because that might be the Yeah. Way. Okay. Ours is it's manual. But with us, I, 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 I'd, I'd like to think that wasn't the issue. With us, the issue was the fact that people feel betrayed. People feel like there is no safest delivery whatsoever. And people feel like they've been like... Uh, waiting for houses that were promised to them be young people have done they, they've furthered their studies up to having a phd but people are not working yeah you know so i it's just those issues and i don't know it just really don't on me that um but you know what i i, I was saying you know the mandate of the the anc ne? is right it's the leadership that we need to fight against because we can't have old people that are taking decisions about our lives when they don't even know our problems, you know? 
So I just feel like young people need to fight to be in leadership positions. Young people need to fight to have their voices heard, not just in social media, but to actually have the platform to say, these are the issues that young people are facing. And this is what we need to talk about. Yeah. It's what you're saying resonates with Nigeria so well. Like it's top notch. Like you could just, all you need to do is to replace South Africa with Nigeria and it would still make sense and obviously you know Big Brother is a big thing in Nigeria and everyone always argues like during Big Brother we vote in millions hundreds and millions of votes like we come out and we vote I even vote but during elections we just sit down and it's the same thing we feel cheated we feel our voices yeah. are being heard I mean What's the point? At least Big Brother, we know that the results are verified. Like, it's hard Mm -hmm. to cheat the system. At least that works, you know? Mm -hmm. We form parties, we form, like, cliques, who likes who. It's ridiculous how we... And I wish, like, somebody could come out with, like, a theory where the two are merged, where it's like, okay, this is what attracts young people to vote. Because, I mean, you're saying, oh, like, young people should come out and contest. But the truth is, I don't know if I would vote for the young person. I'll just vote for the old man that everybody knows. So it's a lot, is it's it's a lot more than just contesting. It's about getting people in that right frame of mind, making it easier, the infrastructure. Why should I be queuing up for five hours just to vote? You know, and yeah. you know, you're still afraid that some thug might come and tear open the ballot box or might shoot you dead. You know, it's just, it's a law, it's, it's a law. And I just always wonder, like, is democracy really the way forward for Africa? Like, if all the time, year after year, all this time, freaking time, we're having this say, and it's only like 20% of the population that is listening. Mm-hmm. Is democracy yeah. really the thing? Is it really, can not someone come up with a different political theory for us to practice? I don't know. Well, what if, like, the government was in charge of basic things basic i think maybe the problem is government is in charge of too much um if they're in charge of basic things then be easier to vote and you hold them accountable and then you vote for your local what should be more important is like local Mm -hmm. elections yes those are i guess more of what your values are and you can be more involved with those i don't know that is so that is true yeah, I agree. Why should it power be in the middle when, when yeah, and there's no power given to the local people, and that's what Nigeria were fighting for, and Southeast and Biafra like give more power to the regional bodies than to. I don't think it will really make a difference in Nigeria, but I think should, that power should even be broken down to smaller yeah. pieces. But uh, who knows? Yeah. I wish more black people to do like politics PhD and come up with a solution. I think it'll happen. We'll see. All right. So I'm going to go into what the book is about and then we can start our discussion from there. Okay. All right. So Period Pain by Kapano Matwa. It's about a young lady by the name of Masechaba who is a medical doctor and she's I think, I believe since she started her period has suffered from abnormal period pain since she was a child and actually went into medicine, into the profession of medicine to increase her odds of finding someone who could perform a hysterectomy on her. As a child, when her period pains had started, she, she would look for doctors who can help her with her issue, but she could not find any. So that's why she went into medicine. Um, so the book explores Masachava's mental state in her medical career which has in part been shaped by the shame associated with her periods, along with the xenophobia that exuberated from her mother. Um, Working in the government hospital system, she sees the corruption, xenophobia against foreigners, and the xenophobia against white people by her friend and colleague, Niasha. She feels depressed with all of the death around her as well, especially knowing that the bad hospital system contributes Uh, the deaths that could be avoided. She feels helpless in this paradigm, but uh, stuck because of her student loans that she must pay off. 
She eventually gets into activism. She creates a, a petition against xenophobia in the hospital system, which makes a lot of people upset and so upset that she was raped because she continued to bring awareness um, to the issue. She took some time off of work after, um, after being rape, raped, which gave her time to reflect about the people in her life who were so hateful uh, towards others. So mm -hmm. then we ask the question when we read the book, uh, it gave her time to think about God as well and why certain things are allowed to happen. If I miss anything, feel free to add. Are you done? Yeah, that's essentially. What? That <laughs> what? She got pregnant. <laughs> she did. The hell? <laughs> yeah, to be honest, I read the book twice. I just finished the book again yesterday. So she got pregnant and. <clears throat> So basically, she she named her child the gift because she just saw out of all the misery and all the contemplations of life and everything, this was the one gift that came out of it. And against all odds, even if the child's father was one of her rapists, um, she just bonded with the child in the beginning and the book ended with her going for immunizations with the child and just even at that moment trying to protect her and deliberate on the pain she was about to feel so it was a nice circular end where the book started with her period pains but also the constant flow of blood consistent flow of blood but also ended with blood in the end as well through the immunization and um, procedure for the daughter and the pain as well associated with it so um yeah, that was it. Thank you for that. I totally. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, she's gonna say it. Uh huh. She's gonna say it. Yeah, she's gonna. Totally forgot. Okay, so let's go into discussion question. Um, okay. Okay, so I'll start with you, Weiwei. What is a significant takeaway for you from this book? Okay, so I have different uh, uh, different parts uh, on the book that really like that I can relate to. But holistically, I personally felt like the book was a summary of one's life and the environment that they work and live in and the type of people that you have in your circle with the influence as well that they have on you as a person. I actually went, tried to go through the book to, to, to find that text that really resonated with me in regards to Tiamo's death. And there's a part, uh, okay. There's a part where she states that uh, it's page 21. She says, of course, I didn't expect, expect a response. I am not crazy, nor was I in denial, but people moan differently. Um, and I was entitled to moan whichever way I, I saw fit. The people at Gmail didn't seem to mind. They kept on delivering my emails to Tsiamo, just like they'd always done. Not like Ma or Malume Softly or Gogo and everyone else who would have minded a lot and were nothing like they'd always been. I, I really like that part because I have had to deal with um, the loss of a loved one in my life, you know? And it's so funny how people say with time it goes away. And I feel like with time you just learn to, to deal with it. Yeah. So you work around dealing with it, but it never goes away. Mm -hmm. You know, you just let it, you accommodate the loss, you accommodate the pain, you accommodate the, the loneliness in your life in a way that is suitable for you and your schedule and you having to go on with your life. But it never goes away. Like the pain, it, it doesn't even fade. Like when it comes to you, the it, it's it's the pain is not measurable. Tomorrow you can't say it was really, really hard. The following day it was semi-hard and I could go on with it. The pain is the same, you know? So what really stood out for me re, like holistically is the fact that she was able to deal with Tiamo State the, the best way she could. Mm 
-hmm. And she allowed herself to do crazy things as long as they made her feel better and they made her move on with her life. And I feel like I respect her so much for that. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. Even though her mom looked down on it, right? But yeah. Her to become like this powerful this doctor who fought for mm -hmm. the rights of people who weren't being looked after well. Um, yeah. In, in that environment where people didn't want her to pay attention to those people. So that's, yeah. so I, yeah, I respect that about her as well. Yeah, yeah. And I understand that uh, pain, it doesn't go away. So I've also lost, no. and you just, especially when you go through life and you, there's different challenges in your life, like you learn to deal with it in a different way, like the way mm. that switches, but the pain just, it, it's just constant. Yeah. yeah. You learn different ways. Yeah, constant. Yeah. The, only, the only reason why you feel it's gone away is that unfortunately time moves on time will always move on time will move so at that point it's like oh five years then 10 years and then you realize oh mobile phones are now out oh we now have emails and this person yeah. was over here and then yeah. surely that's how it feels like it's fading but yeah it's it's always like a gaping hole it's always there it's always like yeah. what this person have done if they were here how would i have reacted imagine if they were here imagine if this so yeah, the temporary um, amnesia or forgetting the person is just the fact that time moves you along real fast. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And and you know, and the fact that her her life was full of pain, like from the onset of the book, her life was just full of pain. That she it became a norm to her, so she was able to fit it into her schedule, fit it in. Her, her her life as a doctor fitted in her life as a mother mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know so yeah yeah I think I just like the way this author just everything you feel it it's so real it's very raw like the emotions and everything you go through because I'm sure like a lot of other books they describe mm -hmm. um, like different situations, the loss of, I was telling Ugochi, this is the third book we've read this year that describes sibling death. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this one makes it very real, obviously mm -hmm. in a different context, but the whole book, like as small as it is, everything you feel it, as the author is going through it, you so, feel it. And that's the that is so about true. this book. Like, um, yeah, small written, not, not much in terms of plots, but like the story itself, everything is raw. You feel it. Yeah. Yeah. I think what I took away from this book, one of the things is the idea of what a hero is. Mm -hmm. um, she says that, I don't have the exact quote, but most are broken and tired people. And she, when she set out to do what she's do, what she's doing in her career she says I don't know how I expected to feel doing good so the idea of a hero like they in in trying to save other people it's emotionally draining physically mm. draining it's a really tough yeah. job and does do does one actually want to go into into doing that since it's so tough you know so yeah um, it had me question the idea of a hero, mm. um, who we look up to and what they, what they actually do, like what they've been through for, you know, is it, is it an yeah. easy to be a hero? Yeah. That's what I took away from. That's one of the things that I, that stands out for me in this book. Yeah. Ask this question. The main character, Masachaba was raped and blamed for it for the most part. Um, in present-day South Africa, is there support given to people like Masichaba to prevent rape and to deal with the trauma it may produce? Anyway, there is. There. there is. You know, we, we have a lot of, like, organizations that deal with that. We have our hospitals, especially when, when uh, it comes to responding to such people, like testing them for HIV and if they're not pregnant and whatnot, they are given like um, the best, the best like treatment, you know? It's just that in most cases, 
those those cases are not reported because people are scared of being shamed by the community you know so that's where the problem starts because people don't come forward because they're scared of what what other people might say about them the necessary like treatment to to help them so there's not really that support then to emotional and psychosocial yeah. support for people to be okay with coming in and saying I have been raped and I need help. There is, there is, because we have, obviously there are certain people that might feel like, okay, I don't want them to know based on this and this and that. But in, in most cases, we even have like uh, counseling where you can even go as an anonymous person. So that person won't even know that you are where we're from South Africa or whatever, you just call that person and that person is available to you 24 seven, you know? So honestly, it's, you know, I always say to people that you need to play your part so that others can play your part, their part and then you, you we, we can all win and all come to a solution. But now you can't want everyone to go 100% whereas you're not even trying to meet them halfway. Right. But there are like yeah. support facilities for people like that all over the country. Yeah. But, um, just for Master Chavez's case, is that common? Is that, or was that like a very unique situation? So when when you hear about Master Chavez's story and the rape story, is that a one-off? Do you think, or in modern-day South Africa, people get raped because of that? You know what? To, to tell you the truth, I, 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 think, I think it's not something new. Yeah. It's so sad that I'm, I, 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 I don't even like saying that as a woman, you know, because it just makes me shiver. But it's nothing new. Like people, you know, I, we hear stories where people get raped because they just refused to, to say hello back. Mm. You know, so in Mati Chavez's case, it was more of, okay, so you're going to protect foreigners. Let us show you what we'll do to you if you pro protect people don't even belong in our country. Mm. Yeah. What comes to mind to me right now is like um, the, I guess, male dominance, like compared to the United States, where I feel like uh, men are more scared of women <laughs> at this point. So I'm looking at the com the comparison to see uh, how I guess men's I don't want to say men's role in in South African society, but the the power that they're given. Does it make sense? You know what? It's not, I think I I think I get where you are trying to go. Women have the power, you know, over men. It's just that women don't know how to use their power. Mm. yeah it's like our main like downfall as women everywhere we mm. don't know how to use our power and when we are given that power we misuse our power mm -hmm. so the difference with men is that they have little power but when they have it they use it to the core yeah they they can exploit so with here, we, we, in South Africa, we are dealing with a lot of patriarchy. Um, again, because I read the book the second time, like I, I went over like granular details. Like when she went back to the police station to, re, to kind of revise her statement and just how inaccurate it was. Again, it could be from her mindset and everything is relative and she was just being very sensitive. But um, I think the police officer missed certain details um yeah you know yeah. it was just very shady like and it's almost like they were complacent or complacent, is it complacent mm. or complacent or both i don't know in in accepting yeah. that you know this this happens on a daily basis just get used to it you're not the first person you yeah. will be the last um again it could be her own mind that the way she's telling it is from her perspective, but it's just interesting that even the law enforcement, they were like, okay. And it does happen. Like we have cases where, like for instance, uh, when we were, we had um, 
in my next movement. Mm -hmm. People, young girls, like went out there wearing miniskirts and whatnot because we have cases where you get raped because of what you're wearing, not because of what you said, not because you provoked a guy mm -hmm. and have the audacity to say, but she was looking for it, mm -hmm. you know? We have police officers, especially male police officers that will say, yeah, but how true is it? Because they get drunk and they sleep with every man that is at the party, you know? So it's, it's, it's not always accurate, and I'm not going to lie about that. It's not always accurate, but the help is there. The support is there. You just need to go through the right channels to get the support that will be relevant to you and that will be of, of, of you know, that would help you as an individual. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, yeah. Just a, it's just a strange, vicious cycle in the sense that People are getting raped, but they are not reporting it. And when they do report, do they receive the accurate amount of treatment, not only physically, but like emotional support, law enforcement, nurses not judging you for them to report an incident if it happened again? So it's just a whole circle. And I just yeah. want where we can start from, you know? And why yeah. the rates seem to be quite prevalent in or people say that the rates are quite prevalent in South Africa. Why, yeah, why that's the case? I think, I think, you know what, especially with us, I think our biggest downfall is social media, because especially when you're a very well-known person, when you have influence or when you're a celebrity, mm -hmm. everyone will have an opinion about your case. Yeah. Like, <laughs> what you just said like if it happened and you didn't report it and you had to wait for two months and then people will ask Google, why why did you wait like mm -hmm. she's probably seeking for attention or it's a pr stunt or so everyone has their own opinion yeah you know so i think that's the most difficult part having to deal with that emotionally you know because yeah. i i personally feel like there's just so much uh, a, a, a psychologist or a therapist can do in that sense, especially if you 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 popular, because it will always be there on social media. Even when you find, you will find it there. You know, someone from the UK is like, yeah, but she deserved it. I used to go to parties with her. I used to see her, and she was always dressed like a hoe. You yeah. you know what I mean? So it really does differ. Uh. Yeah, but the, the emotional support is there. I like I honestly don't want to lie. The emotional support is there. It's just how you take it. Yeah, seeking seeking that support. You have to Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yes, yes. You have yes. to comb through all the rubbish and just find it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it comes with a lot of rubbish. Drown all the pages. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Yeah. All right, so what do you think about the theme of femininity, femininity and blood that runs as a common thread throughout the book? Um, I'll go with you, Amra. <laughs> okay, yeah, as I've said, um, it was good that I read the book again. Yeah. Uh, I saw like, the blood theme, um, the circle of life, starting with the period pain and then ending with that. I think what stood out for me was the part where she was like, I'm a doctor, I'm this and this, but that all that doesn't matter because I have a vagina. And to me, it's just crazy. Again, because we live in a patriarchal world, how at the end, you're, that's what you're reduced to. Even if you're like president, um, what's that her name? Selif Johnson, or like your Hillary Clinton, your Michelle Obama. You have a vagina you can still be overpowered and raped and that's just the fact of life so that was just um really interesting to me and then so i think the author did a really good job of of course bringing that out that this is the kind of world we live in that we are still reduced mm -hmm. to this and the lot of other gibberish that comes with it the 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 fact we have to go through periods and um, periods that could be painful or could be um could last a long time till you need a hysterectomy or whatever 
and um so that ran throughout and then you have to watch your appearance make sure that you have pads and everything so that you're not stained so just again you have to be careful about your image and then that affects your social circle and and it's just like this is all happening to one gender like where are guys in all this please and (laughs) you have to deal with that and then that chooses your profession how you interact and blah 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 and then you now go through that crisis where something awful like a sexual assault happens to you in the middle of that um and then eventually like you now have to go through the painful um process of trying to recover from that sexual assault then you that she's she's i'm surprised she didn't get like an std then she went through pregnancy so it's just that flow i'm, I'm just yeah. going to ramble on but it's just crazy like the whole book like women you as a woman you were just never given a break <laughs> Just being a woman, yeah. physical structure, you were just not giving a break from the, the time she was a teenager right up to when she became a mother. There was just no break. Even all the time she was um, writing stuff in her diary, I was kind of wondering if it was ever influenced by, is it, P- they call it PMS, right? So like, um, mm-hmm. you know, the, the fluctuation of emotions. Mm-hmm. Because there are some things she was saying that were quite stark, like um, talking about her brother and the fact that he almost deserved the kind of thing, or why didn't he seek help? Just very yeah. stark things. Um, ram ramming her car into Nyasha, you know. I was just wondering if all these things were influenced by like her mood, her hormones, which were already ravaged because of. Interesting. I didn't think about that. Yeah. So it, yeah. it was just never a break ever in the whole book. I just yeah. found that very interesting. Um, yes, I agree with you, Amra. Um, and also, I want to say the hero part. <laughs> that's just in my head. The hero part comes to mind because yeah. I guess the blood is a reminder of, I guess, the struggle of a woman. And she says it's not glamorous. What does it feel like? What does it feel like to be a hero? Like she, she's always going through like these ebbs and flows, I guess, doing the best that she could. So um, yeah, that idea of heroism came to mind yeah. when they came into the femininity in her, her period. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like housewives might feel alienated or excluded. So they're always- yeah feminist that I'm not a feminist kind of thing whereas feminism is just is all about equal rights but it's also respecting yeah. other people's choices and not being judgmental if I want to be a yeah. housewife and I want to cater to my husband and greet him every morning and kneel down that's still okay that's you still being a feminist but it's true to be free enough that if you don't want to do that the next day he's okay with that it's a personal choice yeah you respect a lot yeah. of people that don't want to do that, you know. So, yeah, it's about equal rights, but it's also about really respect. Respect other people's points of view. No judgment, no prejudice. That's what it should be anyway. That's how we should be. Yeah, I agree. Feminism has taken on a different, like a whole other thing. Mm, yeah. yeah. Mm. A bit annoying, but yeah, like you said, Amra, it should be a your right or your choice to feel comfortable doing whatever you want to do. If you want to be a housewife and cater to the family, that's that should be fine, and it shouldn't be yeah. looked down upon. Okay, so the book highlights a lot of stereotypes which we hear about um, in South Africa. One being xenophobia towards other Black nationalists. And in the mm-hmm. book, Masichaba's mother and the hospital staff are prime examples of this. Um, yeah. So do you, what is their justification? Do you think they have justification in, in having this xenophobia towards, towards others? I, I guess I'll start with myself. Just, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> no, not, because I think earlier when we were talking about 
you know, sometimes Nigerians are, they take on these professions that in other countries, and you ask yourself, like you rightly said, like, why can't you do this in your own country? Why are you coming here to, do you not have consideration for that? So I'm not saying like, you know, uh, Master Chaba's mother was completely right, but that's why I said, do you think sometimes there's a small iota of, I kind of get what you're saying, but you still need to be nice, mom, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Because you know what, Ne? To to be honest, and I think even the last time we had this uh, uh, discussion, I did say that it's a very sensitive issue. And when you talk about it, you need to to consider other people's feelings and to not step on other people's toes, you know? But it is it, it, it becomes a problem when people in that country are not served because you are literally taking all of the resources. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know what I mean? Like, I do not have a problem with foreign nationals that came here legally, you know? But if you came here and you're not legal about it, be respectful about it. You know what I mean? Because if we look back in in history, and that is like most of the time, that is the the answer that we get from foreign nationals that they'll say, yeah, but um, your people went to exiles in our countries. Our people were kept in camps. People, our people weren't given a grant, weren't given social grant. They weren't given free medical help. They weren't given like all these rights that you have. Our people weren't roaming the streets of your countries and doing as they please. You know what I mean? So that's where the debate comes. But then now it the the it also becomes a problem that well, not really a problem, but a sense of entitlement then arises from our people because. You can't now say someone is taking your job when you're not doing anything. What are you doing to help yourself? Yeah, I think it's the same debate we had in the beginning, whereas, you know, where does it end? You're calling xenophobia or anti-xenophobia, blah, blah, but I, what are you really doing to help yourself out? Of yeah. The, yeah. And the South African case is exactly like America. So I wonder if it's how like the xenophobia attacks and everything is formed based on not really about like South Africans just being extra wicked. It's just more about how the society is formed because it Mm. basically mirrors America. It's the same problem we have where like black Americans or, um, you know, descendants from former slaves feel like the new generation Africans are coming to take everything, take all the grants, resources, scholarships meant for black people. So I don't think it's something we can really find an answer to. It's just something we can observe a pattern to say, Mm -hmm. if you live in this kind of society, then this is what you're going to expect. Um, Right. Yeah, Yeah, I guess it is kind of, it's multi-layers. Yeah, in the case of of Africans coming to the United States and, or foreigners in general coming to the United States and doing well, one must ask themselves, like, what am I doing to to do well as well? Why am I looking at that person who's doing really, really well and I guess envying them or having that xenophobia towards them? Then there's also the government who may be allowing people to come in and not having space for them or not having the resources yeah. to, to help everybody and the government yeah. kind of ignoring their own people. So then that's that. And then human nature takes, it's it's human nature to have yeah. that kind of hatred towards others when you know, you know you're supposed to be getting these limited resources. If that makes sense. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. It's very warped. And I guess the media plays a hand in it or whatever, like popular beliefs, because are they really taking your jobs? Have you ever actually gone to apply and do the necessary things? Or- those things. Is it somebody yeah. that just like pushed up propaganda and so it's, it's just it's literally the society the nature of the society you know? yeah and entitlement and entitlement because uh, yeah. we have a problem yeah we have a problem where South Africans will say um, most foreign nationals are cheap laborers because yes, we okay. literally won't work for two thousand rand but they literally don't mind 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, and you, know? you have to remember that exactly these foreigners came from dire situations. They are really yeah. anything. Like you have migrants that have been on boats, like in the Atlantic Ocean, trying to cross from one country on lifeboats, like inflatable boats. So you can imagine, like they've been through hell and back. So they are, so it's just the formation of the society and yeah. it's yes. even problems. Um, South yeah. Africa only achieved independence less than 30 years ago. Or is it 30 mm. years? No, it's not 30 years. It's 27 years now. So, yeah. as I said in the last, in our last meeting, like, the people that that fought the, AN, the early ANC people, they are still very much alive. So, I think they are seeing these things and they're like, where were you when we were fighting? You know, you were in your <laughs> country enjoy so they are still very much alive so i guess it's the hope that as the new generation comes up um yeah. lines are a, little, a bit more blurred and everyone is softer on everyone else but yeah, yeah. it's also yeah. important when foreigners or when people move to different countries to also respect the culture of that country you're moving into yes yeah. definitely that's also definitely. really important yeah yeah so a lot of times that doesn't happen, and that also drives people uh, to have feel a certain way. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, as it stands, and given that the end of apartheid is still quite fresh in the majority of the population's mind, how do the white and black races view each other and interact? Wait, wait. You know what, ne? I think we've 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 reached. Um, We've reached a point where we tolerate each other. You know, when you know you're supposed to work with someone and you just want to. In fact, I think a good word to use is we coexisting. That's a bit sad, but as I said, you guys have only achieved apartheid. So you're watching like a neighbor who used to maybe didn't shop where you used to shop or you go to the same schools and now you do it. So it's still fresh in. Yeah, it, it is fresh. And you know, what's funny is that white people think black people can't be racist or they aren't allowed to be racist. It's like, what are you being racist about? You know? And yes. I feel like we can, we just probably choose not to be. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I don't know. I think also it comes with being knowledgeable, knowing where the country is coming from, knowing where you want to go as, a, as an individual. And obviously you want to, to, to also be able to, to live a peaceful life. For me, that question, for me, it's very, it's very personal because there are just, to be honest, there are certain things that I wouldn't, it's, you know what, it's, it's like mutual respect. It's like, if you come at me as a white person, I'll come at you as a black person. And it doesn't matter whether you black or white. If another black sister of mine comes at me, I will come at them. You know? So for me, it's, yeah, we're coexisting, but I'm not going to take shit from them. And I still know my history. And I think most of the time, our fights are triggered by that. That, mm. hey, this is not the apartheid era anymore, you know? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. That's very honest, but very sad. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know what to say after that. So there's, so there's no meshing, really. Like, I mean, I'm just imagining that white people have their own friends and black people have their own friends and white people and black people don't really mix. Is that? Yeah, no, they do mix. But there's always that thing that I remember there was um, some gossip or what, but it has always been a thing that when black people make it, black men make it, they marry white men, white women. Oh, you know? the world. Yep. Yeah. There was an outrage in, in, uh, on Twitter that um, maybe it's because white women know how to keep men with money or white women are not as stressful as black women and, and whatnot, you know? So it, whether we, we want to be okay with each other, the society does not allow us to be okay with each other. Because there's like so many things that happen that will always include race. Like you get someone that doesn't even know their job, but they have white privilege. 
because of the color of the skin and you need to teach this person your job so that they can take it. Yeah, I I, I, I kind of see what you said. So your first example of like, you know, you get the trophy, white girl and everything. Like, so people say that as well. But you know, Ugochi, when we're having the conversation in Nigeria, we're surrounded mm-hmm. by black people. So we see it as gossip and move on. We're all black in the area, right? So yeah. <laughs> well, whereas in South Africa, like it's stuck. The person, like after having that serious debate on Twitter, a white girl pass you and you're just like, like, you know, yeah. you go to yes. school and you're just triggered. So the whole racism debate around the world, I can see like South Africa being the melting pot where you, you, you get triggered by everything. Even the Black Lives Matter, I'm sure, was like a huge thing in South Africa. It, it was. It was. I, 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 I find that very... Whereas Black people be like, oh, yeah, well, um, yeah, that's in America. It doesn't happen here. We're all Black. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you see what I mean? So, uh, yeah, I find that very interesting. Okay. The Niasha's character was paradoxical as she constantly said the Black South Africans were weak while also not fully in support of Masachaba's campaign. How do you view this character, Nyasha? Mm. Nyasha should have just went back home. I agree. I feel like she came <laughs> in as a foreigner. She was, she was a doctor, but she did have to um, do some certifications, right? To be able to do surgery. But she, she, I mean, she was on her way. She could have done that. It would have just taken her longer. And she's hating on people. I wouldn't even say white people. People in 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 someone else else's country, not your country. I think for me, I just felt like Nyasha had so much to say, whereas she could have implemented all the things that she was saying that could have made South Africa better in her own country. Literally. <laughs> <laughs> Good point, good point, good point. Um, you know, like, yeah. But remember, yeah. like, foreigners, they don't come to South Africa because they they, they see South Africa in, par- in power with their own, at power with their own country. Like, as I said, they've come from dire situations where South Africa is their only hope. So when you say, oh, they could have done that in their own country, they would have been executed in their own country or starved to death. So You see, yeah, that's the thing. I'm so sorry to cut you. I think that's the problem I have is that I think we're very lenient Mm. that people can just come here and do their bullshit and they just go on with their lives. You know, whereas in their countries like this order, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. so that's that's the brick wall. That's the the fight, the argument. You know, why are you coming to be so free in another person's country where in your own country they won't even give you that opportunity? So is that fight? Mm-hmm. So do you want Yasha to be mute? That's another thing. Do you not want her to express herself? Um but yeah, she was an interesting character. Um, I think I think for me, it wasn't a matter of her not expressing herself. I think for me, it was a matter of she projected a lot. Yeah. I, I don't have... A, yeah, I don't have... Yeah, I don't have a problem with you as a Nigerian woman coming to my country and saying, yeah, but you know, your security system, if you did this and this, I think it would have been better. But it, you, I, I'd be able to take that, mm-hmm. you know? But if you come to me and you're like, you South Africans are, are stupid. Like, how can you allow something like this to happen? You're so stupid. Like, you know how to be doctors, but you can't even think. It, now you are projecting your feelings. I just feel like Nyasha was a very angry Black woman. She was very yeah. angry. Yeah. Like, yeah. I always wonder why... I, I find it paradoxical the, her relationship with Mashaba because like Mashaba is that is that and I do this as well. Like if I really like somebody, I chase you, man or woman, like I chase you and make you my friend. And then I back <laughs> off if I, I don't have to. but yeah, the point is that she like bashed Haka and made 
um, Yasha, her friend. So she was obsessed with her, obviously. And then yeah. at the end, she was just, yeah, she almost stabbed her. That's why she w- had to be admitted to a psych um, program. But she almost, and even if you say she was going through a psychotic break, like at the end of the day, Nyasha must have really grated on her for her to have brought out a knife to almost stab her because your exactly. feelings tend to come out in those situations. That's number one. And number mm-hmm. two, she didn't bother inviting her for, even if she was blaming her mom, she didn't bother inviting her for her baby shower. She didn't call her to apologize. And then she left the country. So it's that kind of thing where she didn't admit it because I think she was a naturally polite person, a nice person, Mashaba. But yeah, nah, yeah. you could tell she was a bit worn out and tired of Nyasha. Yeah. Whereas yes. in the beginning, she was obsessed. Um, and why I say it's paradoxical as well, because in the beginning, like you kind of wonder why, what made her fall in love with Nyasha um yeah why couldn't she get that personality from another south african why did he have to be a foreigner so is it the professional way um the foreigners usually are because they made mention of quite a number of nigerian doctors which was interesting um so was it that professional way she liked but at the same time just hated anyone hated like the same people bashing south i don't know it was just very, I'm just trying to draw one stupid. Like, why was, why was she drawn to that kind of character? Yeah. It's interesting why she was drawn to that kind of character. Hmm. She didn't mention any other South African in, doctor in the book. The only mm-hmm. one I remember is the Nigerian doctors. And the only part mm-hmm. she mentioned, like, a South African medical person were the nurses who were exenophobic. So... Um, do you think it's because her mom was also like that but but I mean that's kind of what she's used to comfortable with comfortable in what sense because her mom is also very xenophobic so what do you mean comfortable that she 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 has learned how to communicate with people like her mom so she's comfortable communicating with someone like Nyasha who also complains a lot she might not like it but she's comfortable with it because that's what she grew up with oh i think it's the opposite i think her mom yeah. got to her <laughs> yeah and i think way- I, I i i think she was curious. Hmm. curious she was yeah yeah she was very curious like i i see it with mm-hmm. myself like yeah. if you guys were to come this side I'd want to chill with you guys because I'm curious of where you come from, what you guys do, what angers you, what you think about my country. And like hanging out with ordinary South Africans because we share the same problems. Ah, okay. That, that's a very interesting point. Yeah, mm-hmm. but I feel that by the end, there's something just, either she was just tired of Nyasha's complaints or her mom actually just got into her head. Where And the rape as well. Don't forget the rape that they raped yeah. her because she was anti-xenophobic. Yeah. So she was just like, you know, I'm xenophobic with you guys. Let's yeah. let it go. And she was just tired of it all. Yeah. So it was just, yeah, yeah. it was really interesting. The beginning and end of their relationship was just like, went complete opposite. Yeah. Opposite. Yeah. Um, so... I think Weiwei, when we talked last time, um, you mentioned that reverse racism is prominent in South Africa. Can you explain or expand further? So, um, so by that I mean like our racism is we 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 even experience racism amongst each other, you know. So with us. A race is, is an issue for everything. Race is our, our escape goat. Like we use it to get away with things. We use it when we want to demand things. We use it as a sense of entitlement that, you know, our forefathers fought for this. Therefore, I deserve the, the issue of land, you know? Yeah. We, yeah, we still feel like we are, uh, 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 the, the land is ours. 
you know, we should get the land without any uh, compensation. You, you know what I mean? Because it was taken away from us. Mm -hmm. You know, so uh, the issue of, of, of race for us, it's, it's broad, hey, and it's very complex because mm -hmm. we use it amongst each other. Yeah. Amongst I mean, each other. Do you mean amongst what? You said you use it amongst each other. Black on black, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like you get, you get, um, for instance, you get like these popular guys that always hang out with white people that they've developed the accent. Like, and you can tell that, but really, like, you're just another black man that is being like, pulled by the by the nose by a white person you know and you get that a person saying to other black people yeah you guys are lazy you guys that's why um uh you guys don't you you'll never yeah, our our racism is really complex yeah it reminds me of um what's going on in the u.s now um because they have something they're trying they're trying to appease black people and trying to say that you know white supremacy white people are bad they're trying to teach mm -hmm. something called critical race theory in schools to kind of make white people white kids understand that they their ancestors did something bad in the past and they should also feel bad now so oh i think God. yeah that's fostering that reverse racism yeah. Um, so I guess, I guess not not exactly like what's going on in South Africa, but there are some components that are similar. You know. I, I I I don't I don't ever see South Africa teaching white kids that their ancestors did wrong. I don't ever think that will happen. But why should they teach that? It's the same way I keep telling people. But it's not like we teach slavers because there were black slavers in nigeria and other part in ghana like in the coast not like we say oh your ancestors sold people to slaves they are bad 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 we did things to each other we murdered twins just because you had a twin we killed them and things like that so i think that's the problem that's one of the problems in the world like for other people, we judge them based on their ancestors and their history. But for ourselves, well, we don't judge ourselves based on that. So there's this conflict. Yeah. You see what yeah. I mean? Yes. We hold the same standards. Yes. So I just find that very interesting. Nobody's right. Nobody's wrong. Yeah. So. True. It's, it's just, although I feel like it's very important for us both to learn our history, it's very important for Black kids to know where they come from and to know that they are, they are superior regardless of their Black skin, that they are beautiful, that they're intelligent, that they can become whatever they want to become. Because I remember our president, um, uh, 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 Nelson Mandela once said, there is no child that is born with hatred. A child is taught how to hate, mm -hmm. you know? So yeah. I, I personally feel like all these places of history shouldn't be abolished. Our kids need to know about it so that when it does happen that one of our kids meets a racist kid at school, they still know who they are, you know? And it all starts with us having having to read our own people's books this thing of 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 our kids reading books of white authors and whatnot really it it, it really needs to if if it makes it, it's making a difference in their curriculum it's fine but at our authors as well we have really good writers we have really good black writers but then that takes us i think to go into schools and say here these are the authors that you may want to look at um, who have True. come from Africa. Yeah, I don't think there's True. enough of us doing that. Because I had a conversation yeah. with um, a family member the other day, his, his wife, she's white, she's a teacher. And she said, and her kids are half Nigerian, half white. So she said, yeah, her kids, when they do reports about Nigeria, all they talk about is, um, for the most part, corruption. That there's not a lot of 
books offered in the school that say that teach other things, right? Yeah. She said it takes people, it takes our people to go in there and do that, but not enough of us are doing that. Yeah, so, that is true. Yeah. So kids don't have any other good thing to say about Nigeria. Right. Yeah, it really takes us to do it. We can't expect we can't expect others to do it for us. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. The next question, looking at other parts of the world, such as Liberia, the USA, et cetera, and how they were created, do you find it ironic when people criticize South Africa? Um, and what is your general general view about human society? So let's go, let's answer the first one first. Do you think it's ironic when people criticize South Africa? Um, you know what? I, I actually wanted to look up that question and just read on it. I, I actually wanted to read about the other countries first and not just take what I've seen or what I've heard might not be true. But my general view is that regardless of what the, the standards are, at the end of the day, we all want an, uh, a, 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 a good economical country, a country that is able to, to generate money and is able to make ends meet by providing the, the service delivery that has been promised to the people. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I, South Africa is trying to do that. It's just that it's not doing it in the right manner, just like mm -hmm. any other country. The U.S. would kill any country that what has to that was to interfere with their economical status. You know, mm -hmm. with South Africa is, is that we're very lenient, even on things that we're not supposed to be lenient about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in regards to the, um, I don't know if I answered the first part correctly. Well, I guess in terms of, um, so Li Liberia, you had the return of the slaves from the yeah. US, and that's how Liberia was created. And then those returned slaves began to discriminate against the natives. Oh no, that, you know what? The apartheid system ruined a lot of things. Mm -hmm. Like it ruined a lot of things, but I'm just going to be honest with you. And I think the fact that I, I grew up with an older person, I got to listen to the stories of apartheid and I got to be, I got to be more um, insightful of what happened compared to what's happening now. The only good thing about apartheid is that there was order. Even though it was implemented wrong, there was order. People used, no one would, would, would say they don't want to go to school anymore. Everyone went to school. Everyone used to work. You know, it's just that we didn't have equal opportunities. We didn't have the freedom that we have now, you know? So, you know, I, I, I can't compare apartheid to anything because it was really a di disgrace to our people. It was really mm -hmm. degrading to our people, yeah. You would agree with people that have had um, similar draconian structures in their country. If they criticize South Africa, you'd be like, yep, I totally see what you mean. I mean, don't throw, don't throw stones if you live in a glass house, but I see what yeah. you mean. I, yes, especially if they also state that they, they, they're criticizing the apartheid era then yes, I'd say, okay, yeah, well, we didn't have much opportunities. There were good things about it, but maybe I see it as good things based on what's happening now. Now, yeah. But the people that, yeah, the people that were actually in that situation still feel like, yes, but we weren't, we, everyone worked, but we didn't have the same opportunities. You were either a teacher, a policeman, or, or a, 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 a tea lady. You know, so the fact that a young person today is saying, yeah, but everyone used to work. It's 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 different because now I am able to be a doctor, a lawyer, a musician and all of these things. I can go to every part of South Africa without being told to to take out my my ID and show that I am a, uh, you know, there are perks, but 
I think for a person that is in my age group would compare them based on what she sees now. But for someone that was in that era, it might not be the same view. Hmm. So we're going to just do one more question then and then. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So although the author had a lot of unfortunate occurrences in her life, such as continuous bleeding, her brother's suicide and rape, many people view her as not being introspective with the habit of rendering blame externally. Do you agree with this statement? Hmm. What do you think, Amara? So I know it was a topic the last time we discussed, but I didn't, yeah. I didn't really reflect on it, but I felt she was a victim. <laughs> I think yeah. she was just real, you know. That's one good thing about this author. Like, everything is raw. Everything she experienced, you felt it as well. You being a doctor, being so high up there, but every day you're coming to work on shore, you're seeing somebody dying, even in the midst of the dying, you're just like, why didn't the person come sooner? Or this person should die already so that another bed could be. These are real feelings that usually in a book you can just like um, kind of wash away or say, or maybe summarize it. So I like the fact that, so it, it often felt like she was not introspective because I guess, but you were really reading her mind. And sometimes, things we say in our mind it never makes sense it's very blamey but it's real so I really just like the fact that everything was laid bare she was not good or bad like she she had weaknesses and she also had moments of strength Mm -hmm. yeah I think initially she was more uh rendering blame externally but I think as give an example she said crying is luxury that we just can't that we don't have time for i think this i forgot what this was in regards to but she started saying that um, i remember that part in the book also that um i think when she had her child and her child was going for vaccination like why tell her why tell her child that she's going for the for the shot just let her experience it and you know let her let her enjoy the time that she has before she has to endure that pain You know, do you remember that? Yeah. I remember. Yeah. I so it was, I thought it was her just saying, you know, I'm going to tell her, but I want her to enjoy the moment now. I don't know. That's not how I read it. Hmm. Well, I took it, at, well, I took it as that, like, let her enjoy the moment now. Yeah. Instead of, I think that's in, more introspective because on the flip side, she could have said, you know, we're getting the shot. Let's, let's cry about it. Let's be victims. Let's yeah. be sad. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what, yeah. what do you think, Wei Um, You know, after, I think the first time I just felt like she was just too much of a victim. Mm-hmm. And I think being given the opportunity to go back and read the book and self-introspect as well, because I think that's the, the beauty of this book. It made me self-introspect as well as a person, you know? Mm-hmm. And I just she went through so much pain that it became normal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that is what scared me so much about her, her character is that she allowed so many things to happen and it became normal for her to not take time for herself. I take time for myself to sulk. I take time to sulk. I take time to cry. And I'm just like, you know what? I'm going to cry about it. And then when I'm fine, when I feel fine, then I'll go on with our adult, you know? Right. Right. I think it goes back to what you were saying about the concept of being a hero is that you're still a human being. You still need to love yourself and it's, it's easy to be happy, then make other people happy. It's easy to love yourself and then give love to other people because mm-hmm. you then bring from a full cup you know, you're not taking the little bit of you and giving it to someone else that you leave your cup empty. Right. So pouring from a full cup, you're just literally sharing what's overflowing from your cup. Right, right. Yeah. I agree. Agreed. Yeah. Well, we've come to the end. Wait, wait. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, Thank you. Week.
Um, please let our audience know where we can reach you, we can or see what you're up to. So you can find us on our Instagram page at click uh, underscore book club. Um, and then on Facebook, it's click book club SA. Um, you can even find us on our email at clickbookclub at gmail.com. Let people know it's, that Q, it's Q, not, not, um, it, not the C. click. Yeah. It's C. Is it C? Yeah, it's a C. Isn't it C L I Q U E? Yes, it is. So it's a Q and a C. <laughs> oh yeah, I'm thinking you're talking about the Q in the in the beginning. <laughs> no, of course not. Of course it's not the Q. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no, it's 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 a Q. It's a okay. Q. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I've I really enjoyed this podcast and hopefully in the future you guys will give me accommodation when I come that side or I'll give you guys accommodation if you come this side. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Where do you live? You live in Johann you live close to Johannesburg, right? Yeah, just literally by Mandela uh, house, the same street. I live in Vilagazi Street. Oh, awesome. Okay. Yeah. Well, it's really been a pleasure talking to you. And um, to our lovely audience, no problem. Uh, we appreciate your support in continuing this journey with us. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, and follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Um, if you happen to read the book discussed in this podcast, we would love to hear your thoughts, opinions, or questions about it. Please leave a comment on any of our of our social media handles. We will, we will be sharing our interesting content on our social media platforms and have some informative discussions leading up to the next episode. So up next on the chopping block, we are reading Secret Sun by... <laughs> Do you remember Leila, Leila Lalami. Yes, Leila Lalami. We are reading Secret Sun by Leila Lalami. Um, yeah, going all the way to Morocco. Yes. Interesting book. So join Mm -hmm. us. So we're looking forward to you joining us on the next episode. But until then, take care and have a blessed week. Thank you so much, Weiwei. Nice to meet you.